Um, hello. Today I'm going to be doing more of my calculus course. I have been doing some videos of these. I think this was the last one I did with audio. Then I did these with that. But today I'm going to be doing audio again. Just for a ma another math marathon. I think it's better on Friday since it's just nice to finish it off and have a pretty easy weekend. So that's what I'm going to be doing. If you ever watched the last ones, I've been doing some with derivatives and polynomials. A lot with the derivative parts of it. This 2.1 is more derivatives and limits. So, the chain rule is going to be going up next. There were some. There was a problem at the end of trigonometric functions that affected the result. So today, the chain rule will show how you fix that. Mm. Break a complicated derivative problem into a chain of simpler ones. The chain rule. Consider a function f and the function defined by hx equals f negative x. Um, the graph of h is obtained by flipping the graph of f around the y-axis. Consider a point a in the domain of h and consider a point b for f. Here corresponding just means b equals negative a. What is the relation between the derivative of h and a or the derivative of f and b? So it's kind of like sine and cosine. So let me see. Mm. In the domain of H, mm. Mm. I would believe it would be prime, even though they go different ways. Um. I don't think number three would be right. Mm -hmm. No problem. It may be a of course. The one I thought was going to be like right is. I guess it kind of relates to sine and cosine. Just going to see how. The graph of x is the exact mirror. Of H, so when H is increasing at a certain rate, F is decreasing at the exact same rate, and vice versa. The slope of the tangent line of H at A and the slope tangent line of F at B are opposites. Note that we are not comparing H A and F, F prime A. We only compare H prime A and F prime at the corresponding point, which is B equals negative A. This is very important. So it's only corresponding right now. Let's see the function. Functions function x equals sine and hx equals sine 2x. The graph of h looks like f, but compressed by a factor of 2. Um, no, now that we consider a point a in the domain of h, the corresponding is b equals 2a. Mm -hmm. That's this is where this is the B where F is doing the same thing that H was at A. So we can see a more drastic change because of the B equals two A. Observe the B li lives in the corresponding place to where A lives in the second positive hump. Was a mm. so we have to go to corresponding. They both look like they're increasing. 
Mm. Okay, I'll put that off for now. They're, they both look like they're increasing at a certain rate. They're just increasing, decreasing more rapidly. Um. Hmm. I feel like it would be H. Mm, probably not equals prime. I guess they do. They will eventually do the same thing. Would it be 2F? Because it's double. Let's see. I'm going to do that. Okay. Phew. Yeah, I was thinking since the formula B equals 2A, we just can do that again, but oppositely. As X moves from left to right, we go through H twice as fast as we go through F. For example, F goes from 0 to the top of the hill in pi over 2 units, where H, where H has to get there in half the amount, pi over 4 units. We expect the slope of the tangent line to h to be twice as much as the slope of tangents to f, but only the slopes at corresponding points. As in the previous problem, we are only relating h prime a and f prime b, where b is the point corresponding to a, and this is the case at b equals 2a. Yeah, that arguably would make sense. Because it would be equals, because they don't have a really relative graph. Unlike this one, which they were just flipped around. Well, I don't know if they would have the same rates if you were to double function of x. But I'm not sure about that. With these examples in mind, let's turn to the idea behind the chain rule. This rule tells us how to take the derivative of a composite function, f times g. Recall that f times g just means we do g then do f as f times g x equals f times g and x. Picture three number lines originally vertically, as shown below. We start with a point a in the first, yeah. and g transforms it into a point b, the second line. So b equals g a. Then f takes a point b and transfers it into c, and so c equals f times g times a b is going to be the corresponding point to a i'm gonna make sure to take a picture of that so we can see and then g and then f as we go on mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And it goes from A to B to C. Now suppose that G prime equals 2. Let's recall the input nudging view of derivatives. Under this view, G prime A equals 2 means that if we look at point X, which is the change of X away from A, where the change of X is small, then G will send the point approximately 2 change of X away from B. In other words, Hey, G has a magnifying factor of 2 near A. So, sorry. <laughs> so, it has a relative same exact graph, like the same way, but either above or below X. So, it would be basically the same, the same distance. Now suppose that f prime b equals 3. This means similarly that f acts with a magnifying factor 3 near b. So that point near b gets sent to f, sent by f to point approximately 3 times the distance from c. So the point b plus 2 ray of change x now gets sent by f approximately to c plus 3 times 2 ray of change x which is just C times 6 ray of change x. So, I wonder if we do have to hear. Let me just see. Mm. 
Yeah, I could see that. Almost looks like a separate graph, just at a faster rate. Because we get um how much X has moved, which is approximately two from B, and then which is just a ray of change, and then we go up the three times of the ray of change of X, two times ray of change of X. Then we receive a graph like this where it's increasing. Here, ray of change X is very, very small, but A, B, and C are not necessarily close together. So starting with X, a point X, ray of change X away from A, we end up with a point approximately 6 ray of change away from C. It means the derivative of F times G at A is 6. The idea here is actually very simple and hopefully very clear. When doing G and then F, the magnifying factors multiply, and hence, since the derivatives just multiply. So it's just the distance away as the ray of change. See? It says right here. As the first one, it should say the distance between X and A is the ray of change of X. And then we kind of do the exact same thing. We go from that, which was before we knew that B was going to be 2x. And then we just do 2 ray of change x. And then times it by the next number, which was 3. But remember, we have to multiply the derivatives at the corresponding points. That is the derivatives of G at, at A times the derivative of F at B. So their meeting point. Let's translate this idea from the last pages into notation. The let me take a picture. The chain rule says that the derivative of f times g at a is the product of derivatives at the corresponding points. Um. So f times g prime times a equals g prime blank times f prime uh. mm. Mm. so a little hard so commas are separating them the corresponding points so they will have to be would it be a and f g times a a times g a let me see why for the previous pages the derivative is the product of g prime a times f prime b where B is the point corresponding to A. What is the point? As we said above, it's just G, A. We have the chain rule. F times G prime A, which will equal F prime G times A, times G prime A. The chain rule says F times G prime A equals F prime um, G, G, A times g prime a keep in mind this is just saying that the derivatives of f and g multiply when evaluated at the correct corresponding points to apply the chain rule we have to identify which function is g and which is f often g is called the inner function and f is the outer function for example let a check equals sine 2x then the inner function is g equals 2x. The outer function is fx equals sine x. We want sine x, not, not sine 2x. We want f times g to be h, so f should be regular sine function. And the rule tells us that h prime a is f prime. That is cosine evaluated at 2a times g prime evaluated at a. 
So it'd be h prime a equals cosine 2a times 2. What is the derivative of sine x to the second at point x? Mm. You would have to. What is the derivative? Yeah. I feel like it would be 2x, though. Two. Mm. Well, I was close, but not close enough. I guess you just add it. You don't make it. You don't add it and then change it again, too. The inner function is gx equals x to the second power. The outer function... This function x equals sine x. We take f prime and evaluate it at x to the second power, which f prime evaluated at something, which in the case is cosine x to the second power. Then we multiply the derivative of x to the second, the derivative of the something, which is 2x. Yeah, that would make sense. What is the derivative of e x to the fourth plus one? Well, the prime of e is e. So, we just be this. Mm. Let me see the last one. Yeah, I probably. That should be it. I bet it won't, but. It seems like, I guess, maybe not, since prime of E is E, but, mm. Mm. well, maybe it wouldn't be 4 to the third power, plus, I think it will be a plus 1, though. So it will either be A or C. Um, this one kind of goes off this equation, which would just be this. Just changing it. But would that be the same for it? Mm. Because E is a little different. Here I'm going to go with this one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Should I change my mind? The inner function is gx equals x to the fourth plus one. The outer function is function x equals e to the x. The derivative of f evaluate at the something is just ex evaluate at x to the fourth plus one, which is e to the x four plus one. We multiply the derivative of the something four x to the third. What is the derivative of the square root of x to the 100 plus e to the x to the second? Maybe, let me get a hint on you. You may assume the derivative of x 1 over 2 is 1 over 2x negative 1, 2x. Hmm. Mm. I really want to know. Um. It would have to be a hundred x and ninety nine plus something. It would have to be. Hmm. Hmm. The way it be is just this. If you add the two, none of the other equations have those. So I'm a little uncertain about it. Hmm.
Do we have any outer axes? Mm. Mm. No, I'm, I'm not very sure if that would be a next to the second. Here, I'm gonna go back here. Really good. Mm. As I would be to get the two. I guess not. I guess I must have to really tough. Mm. I'll see. I'm a little confused now. We just take this one step at a time. Let's speed the solution up a bit there. To give a sense for how people talk, they're taking derivatives like this one. Our function is basically of the form square root of some stuff. So we differently square root and evaluate at the stuff. So 1 over 2, x to the 100 plus e, x to the second, negative 1 over 2, would equal 1 over the square root of 2 square root of x to the 100, e x 2, which should, yeah, which should almost be like my point, but we do that, yeah. But we have to differentiate the stuff itself, x plus 100 plus e to the x to the second. The derivative of x to the 100 is just 100 to the 99. What about the derivative of e to the x to the second? That requires another application of the chain rule. That derivative comes out to be 2x e to the x to the second. So the derivative of the stuff is 100x99 plus 2xe to the x of the second. So, final answer of the product is these two. Mm. Yeah, no wonder. Try it doesn't include the 2 and the x. And finally, easy to simplify. Mm. I should have seen that. The chain rule has another point application, allowing us to determine the derivative of inverse functions. We call that the inverse fu inverse function of f is a function that undoes the original function. So basically, the inverse of x to the second is the square root of x, and the inverse of e to x to the x power is x. We're sweeping some details under the rug here. But the key idea we need is that the inverse undoes our original function, which can be expressed as f negative 1 times f times x equals x for all x. Using the chain rule, what is the relationship between the derivative of f at a and the derivative of f negative 1 at the corresponding points b equals f a? So what is the relation between the derivative of f a, derivative of f, and mega one? Hmm. They are equal, probably not. They add to zero. They multiply to one. Well, it would have to. I mean, maybe they add to zero. They multiply a one. Mm. Okay. Let g equals f to the negative one. Then g times function of x equals x. Differing. Differing both sides at a. On the right, we get 1. On the left, we get g prime f a times f prime a. We conclude that g prime times f times a equals 1 over f prime a. On a very rough level, this corresponds with the following reason. The derivative of f measures change in output over change in input or change of y divided by change of x. With the inverse function, 
the rolls of y and x are switched, so it's rare to measure change of x or change of y, which is the replicable. This reason provides good intuition, but the chain rule gives a better justification. I'm gonna take a picture of that. Because. Give me one second. Mm. Sorry about that. Let me continue. Recall that the derivative of sine x is cosine x. Consider the function f prime equals arc sine x defined by the formula sine arc sine x equals arc sine sine x equals x, which arc sine x always be taken to a value inside the interval negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. This integral is the range of arc sine x, and the domain of arc sine x is the interval negative 1, 1. For example, arc sine 0 equals 0, arc sine 1 over 2 equals pi over 6, and arc sine negative 1 equals negative pi over 2. So... Mm, so, yeah, it does seem to increase that array of that. Okay. I don't understand that. Let me take a picture of that. Sorry I take pictures of so much. It's just, I think it'll be worth it eventually. Just right. I can't spell like in uppercase. It's kind of confusing how I use it even. Except for notes, at least. I don't really have a lot of uppercase for this. And so on. What is the derivative of arc sine x? I don't want to look at the answer. Hmm. Arch sine x. What is a derivative? Can I just be the Oh, yes. I knew it would be something with the square root, definitely. The bottom two didn't make any sense. They look like just like. They were basically just the normal equation. Let f function x equal arc sine and gx equal sine x. 
These are inverses of each other. The formula for the derivative of an inverse function so that the f, f prime a and g prime b equal 1, where f a equals b or g b equals a, so in this case a equals sine b, f prime a equals 1 over g prime b, which equals 1 over cosine b. How we can get cosine b in terms of a equals sine b? Well, sine to the second b plus cosine to the second b equals 1. So cosine b equals plus or negative square root of 1 minus sine to the second b. A b lies in the range negative pi over 2, pi over 2. So cosine b is not negative. The sine plus sine is always the right choice. So as we can see below, you can just simplify it to that and then it will solve sine to the second, just a to the second, and b, and so on. And I think pretty much that's all the rest of this lesson, I'm going to be doing two more. Mm. Okay, let me see this. Yeah, because I usually like, not always, but I when I do these, I usually like finishing up lessons, and then start and then starting the beginning of new lessons, so then like I can get so then I could finish like the other lesson and start getting a refresh while I'll be going next. So round out your tour of elementary derivatives with some transcendentals. That's a little mean. Elementary derivatives. Mm hmm. I'll continue. Exponentials and log logarithms. Exponential functions like function x equals 2 to the x power come up often in applications. To think about the derivative of this function, we'll have to go back to the limit definition of the derivative just as we had to figure out the derivative of sine. First, let's try to compute the derivative at zero. So, function prime zero equals limit the h is zero. f h minus f zero over h, which would be two h, which if we simplify to derivative, would be 2 to the h power minus 1 over h if its limit is 0. It's not obvious what the limit is, or even whenever it exists. One option is to try plugging the smaller and smaller values. As we can see, we could do 2 times 10 to the negative, so on, minus 1. And then as we go on and on and on, you get this and this and this. You get a closer and closer approximation. So it seems like the limit eh, the limit exists and approaches some value L equals 0 0.693. This turns out to be um, true and we'll see how to identify L exposed potentially. That's just f prime equals zero, but we want the derivative everywhere. So let a be any real number. Mm. What is f prime a in terms of l? So that's just. So let's a be a real number. I see here. Write out the limit de definition for the derivative of a and then multiply it to look like the limit above. Mm. So, we want to get how it will look, look like this. Function x minus function a. Function a minus function a. Mm. Oh. Terms of L. L times 2 to the A. Will that be relative? Okay. 
I definitely got it from that too. I'm just trying to remember trying to get the formula of A, which I did remember. I was trying to convert it. This was definitely the most obvious based on the top equation. So it's kind of the same. We can see here. So using the limit of a derivative as we see here, a plus h minus f a over h, we should go to 2a plus h minus 2 to the a divided by h. And then the limit continue to eliminate. Eliminate the a's. 2h minus 1 over h would be 2al. Or L times 2A. Hmm. Let me see in this one. So, it was kind of the same. Look at that. Ah, oh, never mind. It's the same. Yeah. It just had to be considered a real number. Now, suppose we change the base of the exponential. For example, function x equals 3 to the x. The same reasoning as the previous problem would show that f prime a equals l times 3 to the a, where l is f prime 0. The derivative of an exponential function is proportional to itself. Now the most special exponential function would be the one whose derivative was equal to itself. That is the constant l in the derivative that was equal to 1. As we saw earlier, when b equals 2, the constant in front of the derivative is approximately c equals 0 0.693. The constant increases as b increases, so it makes sense that there's ex exactly one base b, which the constant is 1. We show these ranges to the special place b lie in. Hmm... B equals 2, and the constant, what? So it makes the constant. Mm. Mm. Well, if it was equal to 2. Let me see. Mm. Constant is like approximately one. Um. Mm. Let me see here. Mm. Hang out with bees now. Mm. No, it's close and they're close enough. So, by looking at the values of attraction for very small values of h, like h equals 0 0.0001, we can approximate the constant L for any value of the base b. For example, b equals 2.5, the constant is approximately 0 0.916. For b3, the constant is approximately 1.098. So the special value of b that makes constant 1 lies somewhere in the range. 2.5 is less or equal to b, and then b is less or equal to 3. You may recognize the special value of b seen above is a famous constant called E. Wait. It is a famous, famous constant called E, named after the famous 18th century mathematician Eller, like Eller's formula. Careful computations along the lines of the previous problem show that E is about 2.718. Like pi, E is fundamental. There are many different ways to compute it, many different ways that helps us solve. 
We arrive at E via the derivatives of exponential functions. Well, another way to discover it is by looking at logarithms. Remember, the definition of logarithm, log b, y equals x, means that bx equals y. That is the base b logarithm is the inverse of the function bx. To put it another way, the base b algorithm of a positive real number y is the x one you need to raise b in order to get y. So the base b, so the base logarithm of a positive real number y is the exponent you need to raise b in order to get y. Logarithm with base e is called a natural logarithm. It is in denoted in i and x. So i and e equals 1, i and e to the second equals 2, i and 10 equals 2.3, and so on. Mm. Here's a graph of y equals i and x. Which of these graphs is its derivative? Mm. Well, it's the derivative. This is constantly increasing. Mm. Would it really decrease like B, like that rapidly? Or would it be like C where it's straightforward? Like you can see that it's decreasing. So would it just be? Here I'm gonna go with C. B? I was thinking, but like it just, I guess like if we continue it, it kind of relates to the frown. First I N is increasing. So the derivative has to be positive. That rules out the first option. The key inside is while n, i n is increasing, it's increasing by less and less as the input increases. So kind of like acceleration. So the derivative, while remaining positive, must be self-descending. That rules out the last two options. The graph of the derivative probably looks familiar. You'll see why very soon. Yeah, I already can tell. Note that the graph of y equals e to the x and y equals i into the x are mirror images of each other. One graph can be obtained from the other by switching the values to x and y, which corresponds to flipping across the line y equals x. Here, I'm going to take a picture of this. I'm going to definitely put this in my notes. Probably would need the full image definitely mm. Mm -hmm. Flipping across the line y equals x. Let's continue then. This makes sense because if y equals e to the x, then x equals i and y by definition. We've already seen that the derivative of ex is just ex. So for example, the slope of the tangent line to the graph y um, equals ex at a point 2 e to the second is just e to the second. Why is the slope of the tangent line to the graph y equals i and x at the point e2 to the second? e y to the second. 
It would just be the same. Why are it? Oh. Okay, let me see why. The slope is the continuous change in y divided by the change in x. For y equals e to the x at the point 2, e to the second, this is e2. Flipping the picture across the line, y equals x. Oh, yeah. I get it. You just have to flip it since it's opposite. Flipping the picture across the line, y equals x, we look at the graph y equals i and x, that corresponding point e to the second, too. See that e2, a value of the derivative is flipped to become the change in x divided by the change in y. This is exactly the replicable in the derivative of i and x, a e2 to the 2, so the derivative is this, 1 over e to the second. The previous problem showed that the derivative of i and, to the, I and x at the point x equals e to the second was 1 over e to the second. It will not be a surprise to discover that there wasn't very much that was special about the value e to the second. In fact, the derivative of gx equals i and x at x equals b is g prime equals 1 over b. I'm going to take a picture of that too. Sorry I take a lot of pictures of everything. I just want to gather as much information as I can. An image is really helping. Okay. So, okay. This follows from the fact that i n is the inverse function of e to the x. As we saw in the last lesson, the derivative of f at a and that of f minus 1 at b equals f a are repticles. For any b is more than 0, the derivative of i n and b is 1 over e to the a, which is 1 over b with a equals i and b. Okay, let's continue. Let function x equals i n x. As we show above, function x equals 1 over x, so f1 equals 1 over 1, 1 equals 1. On the other hand, f1 also can be written using the limit definition. And if we explore a fact, something interesting will happen on the next page. Using the limit definition, the fact that f1 equals 1, what can we conclude? So, mm, mm, I am... Um, So, when it be minus one, mm, plus one, why is that? I was thinking it would be minus for some reason. Mm. Oh, yeah, I get it now. The limit definition gives limit of h to 0, f times 1 plus h minus f1 over h, which equals f prime 1. Actually, it's just equal 1. Hmm. Now that, now f prime, I mean f1 plus h equals i in 1 plus h, and f1 equals i in 1 equals 0. So the correct answer is... We have to add one in the equation, so it would technically be zero if everything gets eliminated. We know that 1 over x, i, 1 plus x approaches 1 as x approaches 0. Excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> know that the laws of logarithms give... 1 equals limit of x to 0, 1 over x, i n, times 1 plus x, which equals x, I mean limit x to 1 i, 1 plus x, 
to the power of 1 divided by x. When we take that exponential of both sides, we get e equals limit of x to a to the e to the i in power to the 1 plus x to the 1 divided by x. Or the limit of x to 0 is 1 plus x to the 1 plus x power. Which gives us an in interesting limit expression for e. This gives an easy way to approximate e by plugging in a small number for x. As we can see here. Which uh, approaches the approximate value of e equals 2, 2.71828 continuing. Let's return the derivative of function 2 to the x that we started with. We've seen that function x equals 2x and function prime x equals c2 to the x power, which equals c function x, where c is a constant equal roughly to 0 0.693, as we saw in the beginning. This exercise is the answer from the question, where does the constant c come from? Let the function of x equals 2 to the x and gx equals e to the x. How are f and g related? Well, notice that 2 equals e to the i n to the times 2 because the exponential and natural logarithm functions are inverses of each other. Now take both sides to the x power to get 2x to the, the x equals e i n to the second to the x, which would equal e x i n to times 2 by the laws of exponents. Using the chain rule on the right side, what is the derivative of 2 x to the x? Mm. On the right, 2 x equals... Well, this probably wouldn't be. Wouldn't it just be 2 e? Or would it be 2 e x i n 2? Maybe this. Okay. I was saying, I was like a little confused what would we do with i n times 2. But I saw it. So we got that. The derivative of e to the power of some stuff is e to the power of some st the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. Here, uh, stuff is x i n 2, which is a constant times x. So its derivative is the constant i n t times 2. So the answer is e to the x i n 2 times i n 2. Since e to the x times i, I n 2 equals 2 to the x, the derivative of 2 to the x is 2 to the x i n um, times 2, which allows us to write down the value of the mystery constant c exponentially, c equals i n 2, which equals approximately 0 0.693. And of course, there was nothing special about 2, the derivative of a to the x is a to the x i and a for any positive real number a. We might also ask about logarithms that aren't the natural logarithm. This is an easy question to answer the previous one, as long as we remember the appropriate formula for logarithms. What is the derivative of function of x equals log 10x? And i and x? What? Mm. I'm going to look up here. Sorry. Mm. Mm. I really don't know about this one. Was a derivative back to the town? Hmm. have to be switched so mm. Phew. 
I was worried for a second. I mean, I was thinking between um, D and E. Mm. Mm. But I was just looking at the other ones. It just seems like either the last two ones were the most. But I don't think X should be dividing by those, so it would make sense the last one. Using the charge of base formula, right? Log 10x equals in over in. Now, 1 over in 10 is a constant. The derivative of i in x is 1 over x, so the derivative of a constant times i in x is that constant times 1 over x. We can see by this equation. And of course, the same argument works with any positive real number when a is not equal 1 in the place of 10. And that's the finish of that lesson. Mm -hmm. And then that's you and four to complete. You're making huge strides in calculus fundamentals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I'm not far from done. This is the last one. Mm. Let me see some time on that. I'll do one more. I guess the line years approximation. Apply tangent line to the classic root finding problem. I feel like I'm out of breath from this, from talking so much. I don't even talk that much a lot. Linear approximation. <clears throat> there are many ways of thinking about the derivative. In addition to the definition, there are the graphical view, the input nudging view, and the symbolic view of differentiation. In this lesson, we'll add another view, which is very related to the others. The derivative is a linear approximation to the function. Here is a function where its tangent line is a. What is the equation of the tangent line? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. F prime AX. Mm. It probably would be plus. Mm. Mm. Maybe minus secondly in this equation. Why? I'm going to do C though. Mm, it was minus. I was thinking, but it just didn't feel right. The equation on the line has a post-slope form. Y equals negative Y0 over X minus X0, which equals M. Where M is the slope and X0, Y0, is the point of the line. The slope of the tangent line, of course, F prime A. The line must share A, F A in common with F equals FX. So solving is a basic equation, which... Is basically must but instead it's subtraction. Let's define L X equals F prime A my times X minus A plus F A. Then the graph of L is the tangent line to Y equals F X at A. We think of L as a linear approximation to the function F near A. The idea is that F might be complicated to compute. It might be a high degree polynomial or a trig or a log function. Line lineies, on the other hand, are simple things. Mm -hmm. Think of F like a high quality video and L is like a low quality GIF of a video. Sometimes the GIF is all you need and it can be much easier to work with. A lot of different whole calculus can be summed up by this rule. It is sometimes very useful to replace a complicated function f by its linear approximation l. I mean, it's linear. 
We'll see examples from this principle in this lesson in the next. Let's start with the most basic application of linear approximation by approximating the function. Using the linear equation to function x equals square root x at a equals 9, estimate the square root of 9.3. Mm. What if function x equals square root of x a 3.05? Must have got something wrong. We calculate that f prime a times x minus a plus f a at a equals 9, and the x equals 9.3. Mm, yeah. And then, I guess we could technically use the same equation. The derivative of x um, to the 1 over 2 is 1 over 2 x negative 1 over 2, which at x equals 9 is 1 over 2 times 1 over 3 equals 1 over 6. So we have 1 over 6 times 3 over 10 plus 3 equals 3 plus 1 over 20 or 3.05. The exact value is 3.04995. Continue. Know how easy this is. All we need is the value of the function at a, the function derivative of a, both of which are easy to calculate. And we wind up being able to x estimate something quite complex, but in a simpler way. A equals nine. Mm-hmm. Let me just see this again. Derivative of x one over two is one over two. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cause it's square root. In a, okay, I get it now. Newton's method. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting to interesting stuff. Newton's method is a famous iterative process that estimates the root of functions. Adds hard lies linear approximation. So I'm not. I'm not trying to be rude, but I just like Newton. Um, everything is interesting. Still very interesting. The rule of a function, uh, for a function of the values of x, function equals zero. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Suppose we have a function f we want to find approximately where it hits the x axis. One thing we might want to try is to is to guess a starting point, which we'll call x0, near the root, and instead see where the linear approximation at x0 hits the x-axis. Where does this happen in the picture? In other words, what expression represents a point labeled x1? So, hmm. So it will be subtraction, looks like me. Hmm. Or would it be addition since it's technically moved a little? Hmm, nice. I'm probably going to get it wrong because I'm a little confused in this one, but I'll try. Mm. Yeah, so I was pretty off, to be honest with that. We know that equation for the tangent line at x to 0 is y equals f prime x0 times x minus x0 plus f x0 in the equation. Setting this to equal to 0 and solving for x, we get x1 equals x0 minus, as we see in this these equations. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I guess. 
So, I'm gonna continue and then go back. And then get back the formula again. Mm. Let me just get this. So we'll use that. And then, and then, and then, do this. And I'll continue now. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back. This idea now is to iterate. We start with an initial guess x0, god point x1. Now we continue. Let x2 equal x1 minus function of x1 over function prime of x1. x3 equals x2 minus function x2 over f function prime x2, etc. Continuing. At each stage, we look at where linear approximation to f at xn has a root to make our next guess as to where f has a root. Under many circumstances, their guesses will get closer and closer to the true value of the root. Estimate the root of function of x equals x to the third power minus x plus 1 by calculating the third iteration x to the third using Newton's method. Start with initial guess of x0 equals negative 1. So, the third iteration. So, I believe it would be very close. To, wouldn't it be initially negative 1.22? Mm, it seems like it would arguably get close. <laughs> mm. I thought we'd be getting closer and closer until it reaches a good approximation. I'm going to be reading this for a second. This is a lot of info. So give me one second. I'm going to read it. It's a lot quicker for me and probably quicker for you. Give me one second. Okay, I understand. It's just simplifying. Like, they they do get more and more accurate. As we go on. Okay, so I look at number 10. So we have, like, a repeating formula. So I'm going to take a picture of this. And crop it a little bit. I'm sorry that I take so much pictures. Um, mm -hmm. So this was... Mm, 
So. Let me do repeating formula. You soon. New tons. New tons of method. Ping pong. Mm hmm. Let's continue. Newton's method does. <laughs> okay, let me get that. Does not always work. For example, let's see what goes on. Newton's method doesn't always work. Sometimes things depend on making a good choice for the initial guess, x zero. Consider using Newton's method to estimate the root of this function. For which of these choices of initially guess x, x0 would Newton's method certainly fail to get closer and closer to the root? So, which of the choices would Newton's method certainly fail? I feel like it would be P. Would it be P and mm, P and Q? So mm, Q R O mm, maybe R Q only. Let me see this one again. It'd be P and Q. Q only. I kind of almost gave it away. Q is a critical point. P should work fine. By looking at the tangent line, we see that the first iteration puts us very close to the root. I already see it. Wait, I'll go back. Yeah, Q definitely then It will get us closer. Q is a critical point. So the tangent line there is horizontal. This line will never hit the x-axis. So the next point, Newton's method isn't defined. This method is needed to find the reflection of this equation. Here I'm going to take a picture. Let me get back to the equation. This may take a minute. Okay, let's take a picture of this. Crop it out too.
Mm-hmm. That's good. Yeah, we can... Let me see. We so have the next step, the tangent line at X1 moves us back to the left, to the right of Q. Now we're back in the same region where we start. The tangent line at X2 has a negative slope, and X3 will be pushed to the right. This process may not converge to the root, which is the way to the left of P, Q, P, I mean P. The convergence of Newton's method for a sequence that comes very close to a critical point depends very much on the specific shape of the graph. An initial guess to the left of Q would have worked. The moral that it's not good to pick an initial guess as close to the root as possible. In the next lesson, we'll learn to see another application of linear approximation, this time in physics. To finish this lesson, look, let's look at pro approximations that are better than linear. Let's focus on A equals zero. The formula for the linear f application to F at A is Lx equals F prime zero x plus F zero. L and F have the same value in zero and the same derivative of zero. Mm. Have the same value at zero, the same derivative. I would say true. Mm -hmm. We have L zero equals F prime zero times zero plus F zero equals F zero. And L prime X equals F zero for all X. Remember, L is just a function of this form MX plus B, where M happens to be F zero. So the derivative of M equals F prime zero. So one way of thinking about L, the linear approximation to F at zero, is that the line whose value in the first derivative are the same as F primes at zero. If we want to find a good degree two polynomial that approximates F near zero, it might make sense to find a quadric function whose value, first derivative and second derivative, are the same as F at zero. This ensures that f and the degree two polynomial have graphs that are not only that not only go through the same point, but also increase decrease at the same right and share share the concav t there. <coughs> mm. The general form of quadric quadratic is y equals a x to the second plus b x plus c. What values of A, B, and C give a quadric whose value for derivative and second derivative at zero are the same at F? So Y equals A times X to the second plus B, X plus C. <coughs> a, but the derivative and second derivative are the same as F's. I think it would be C. B. Oh, uh, divide by 2. Yes, 2 a second. I understand that. So, well, the derivative of AX plus BX plus C is 2AX plus B, and the second derivative is 2A. So, value of the quadric at zero is C, the value of the derivative at zero is B, and the value of the second derivative at zero is two A. These are equal to F zero, F prime zero, and F prime prime zero. Respectfully we must have we see in this relative the same is this. In other words, the quadric that approximates F near zero is this. The same equation, including x. The linear approximation to a function at zero is 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 y equals f prime zero x plus f zero. As we just saw, the quadric approximation to a function at zero is y equals f prime prime zero divided by two times x to the second power plus f prime zero times x plus f zero. We wanted to find a cubic whose value first, second, third derivatives at zero were the same as f's. The answer would be 
y equals f prime 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 0 over 3 to times x to the third plus f prime prime 0 over 2 times x to the second plus f prime 0 x plus f 0. So we can see as it changes as the primes go on, which is very interesting. I'm going to take a picture of that. Hopefully that will be my last picture. Mm-hmm. I'll just consume this. Mm-hmm. Let's continue. Do you see the pattern? These polynomials are called Taylor polynomials. And they can be used to approximate a function better and better. Linear approximations are just the first step. There's a lot more to say about them. Like, why do they approximate f? But for now, let's just see them in action. Here's the function sine together with its linear approximation at 0. And its cubic and fifth degree of Taylor approximations at 0. First, here's y equals sine x with its linear approximation y. I'll have to take one more picture. Sorry. Now that we add the cubic expressions, it has to take one more picture. Now that we add the cubic approximation in green, y equals negative 3, negative x to the third divided by 6 plus x. <sighs> Sorry, one more picture, I promise. Oh, it's crop. I'm going to crop it. That was like last picture, and I took like a bunch of more. I might use this for the thumb, thumb gnome. I mean the thumbnail on this picture. And here's the fifth degree approximation in orange. Um, y equals x to the fifth divided by 120 minus x to the third divided by x plus x. Look how much more it closes to approximation with a blue, blue sign function. You can see in this. And that will wrap up this lesson. Mm-hmm. And then that's all. So I will prob probably take a break for the weekend. Maybe, maybe not. But thanks for watching this video. I really appreciate you. I know not much people watch to the end. But if you do, thank you. And you're the ama most amazing person ever. Thank you for watching. I hope I probably will do this again next Friday. Yeah, I probably will. So, goodbye, and thank you for watching. I sincerely appreciate it.